Okay, we're gonna get started here. Uh, my name is Rachel Rudolph. I'm the Extension Vegetable Specialist at the University of Kentucky. And uh, today we're gonna talk about tomato grafting and root knot nematode management. So just a little bit um, for those of you who are not very familiar with nematodes, um, they are non-segmented round worms. They're not um, earthworms. Um, they have cuticle annulations, which you can kind of see in this photo here. Um, and they are bilaterally symmetrical, which, so like, like humans, right? They have the same on both sides. Um, they have no respiratory or circulatory systems. They get their oxygen by diffusion through their through their body and they move dorsal ventrally. So um, that's kind of hard to picture, but if you can think of um, a snake moving like this, um, that's not how they move, they move more like this. So if you picture um, maybe one of those dragons in a parade and they move like this, um, that is more how a nematode work, uh, moves. And it's also called um, sinusoidal movement. So not all nematodes are bad. I do wanna make that clear. So um, there's about 10% of all nematodes that are um, plant parasites and they feed on plant tissue. So they're not, there are nematodes that, that are parasites to humans, but the plant parasitic nematodes, they feed on plant tissue. They're not harmful to us. Um, and what they all have in common is that they have a protrusible spear, which is called a stylet, which you can see here, it moves in and out. So what we're gonna be focusing on today for the purpose of this particular talk is root knot nematode. That is a, it's an extremely um, common um, plant parasitic nematode that um, we find in the Southeast, we find in Southern regions, the Southwest too, um, warmer climates typically. So they are all of the genus Meloidogyne. Um, I will refer to them maybe by Meloidogyne, but probably mostly just root knot. And um, they are a sedentary endoparasite, meaning they move in and out of the roots. And um, the females will kind of set up shop in one root on one plant and lay eggs. And so she becomes completely sedentary as an adult. So there are a uh, hundred species of Meloidogyne, but four species account for over 50% of what was found in the US and are problematic to crops in the US. So incognita, that is the southern root knot nematode that we will be primarily focusing on today. Meloidogyne hapla, that is northern root knot nematode. We do have that in Kentucky as well. You were kind of in this transitional zone here in Kentucky. Um, so we do have both incognita and hapla. Um, and I'll get a little bit more into that, the difference between those two. Um, and then these other two, uh, the Havanese um, root knot nematode and the peanut root knot nematode. So the females can produce over 500 eggs at a time. And they do typically prefer sandy soils, but don't think that just because um, you're, you, you're, you have a grower or you're, uh, you know a grower that's um, in clay, more clay type soils that they wouldn't have or not. Um, we, we found a lot of them around. So they can complete their life cycle in 30 days or less. It's really dependent on the soil temperature. Um, and again, they can produce about 500 eggs at a time. So just to get um, you a little bit more acclimated with what that looks like. So the J2 is the second stage juvenile and they are the infective stage. So um, let's start here, right? So uh, you have a heavily galled root, which is the root knot nematode, right? That's the name for it. Provide minimal, uh, the, you have these egg masses on the roots or right inside the root. Um, these eggs kind of are oval shaped and you can see under a microscope, you do need a microscope to see these. Um, you'll see uh, an nematode forming in the egg. And so this is J1, you can see it, it's still in the egg, but you can basically see that nematode 
uh, forming the worm-like um, body. And then the J2 hatches from the egg and um, is attracted to growing roots. And then um, they enter the roots and migrate to areas of cell elongation. So they will come in here and, and look basically for um, and feed off of um, secretions um, and plant uh, photosynthates, that kind of thing here. Um, they do develop into the J3, J4, and then an adult stage. And that galling occurs as a response to that nematode feeding on, um, on the roots. And so each crop is kind of different. It's a crop response. Um, eggs are then exuded into an egg mass on the outside of the female. So, um, and I, and I would say, again, most of what I have read and found is more in the 500 eggs at a time. This is um, maybe over the course of a season, a thousand eggs. Males are mostly unnecessary, adult males in this species, but um, you can encounter them in, in some cases. But the females are the ones that really can wreak havoc on crop production, J2s and then the females. And so you can see here that um, here is a female with an egg mass right here. So they become kind of globular in shape, the females. They, they no longer look like a, your classic worm shape. So um, the thing that we're more concerned with, right, is what happens to the crop. So as you can see, here is some lovely galled roots, right? This is not how normal tomato roots should look, right? You can see all these galling, this galling. Some things that people I think often miss is something like this, which um, the above ground part. So most people are fami very familiar with this part if they're familiar with root knot nematodes. The above ground symptoms often get missed. So here you can see there's some dieback starting. It starts in the lower leaves first, the oldest leaves, and then it will gradually move up the plant. And you can see here, right? So um, just total devastation. So you may be wondering what is happening back here? Why do these plants look better? And I can tell you that these are grafted in the background and this up here is a non-grafted um, plot right here. So, and we'll get into that um, even more. So some things to keep an eye on, um, you know, this is something that maybe even, even I would maybe walk by and, and it wouldn't necessarily catch my eye, I wouldn't think much about it. And certainly growers probably see this occasionally and, and don't think much about it. Um, certainly when you get to this point, right, you're concerned and you're, you're asking what's, what's going on. So learning to spot the symptoms and, um, can be really helpful in managing. And unfortunately, really the only way to confirm that this is what's happening is, yes, you could take a soil sample um, and, and that would be, you know, that would not disturb this plant most likely, but the, the next best thing would be to pull up a plant sample and, and let us extract, um, try to extract nematodes from the roots. So management options for this a parasite, right? Prevention is going to be key. You don't want to move them around. So borrowing equipment, right, from someone else, you want to make sure that you've cleaned it really well before you use it in your field. Um, if you're buying planting stock, make sure that it's clean planting stock. Um, a lot of this kind of thing happens um, from nurseries. So not so much from vegetable transplants as much, but um, for example, in the Pacific Northwest, uh, where people um, plant um, raspberries, for example, um, they buy, sometimes they used to, less so now is that an issue, but they would buy um, small plants that were grown in a nursery situation. So sanitize equipment. Um, and don't move it around, right? It can be on your boots, it can be on your tools, it can be on your truck wheels, right? All that stuff. 
um, cultural. So this would be um, soil solarization, for example, which my program, my lab is looking into actually this year. Um, we don't have a lot of data right now on this, but we're, um, this will be a big project that we're looking at this summer. Um, crop rotation um, is also an option, but root knot nematode has an extremely wide host range. Um, hundreds and hundreds of crop species are within that um, possible host, and meaning that the root knot nematode can feed and reproduce in the presence of that specific plant, right? So that's what I mean by host. Um, biological, there are antagonistic fungi and bacteria, but um, they are not really commercially available. There's been some research on this. It looks promising, but it's hard to bottle that kind of stuff and transport it and make it effective. And then, of course, chemicals, right? There are fumigants, soil fumigants, and nematicides. Um, these are all... Um, you know, there are various ranges of efficacy. If you're here, if you're a Kentucky grower, um, looking at ID 36, there are a list of nematicides and fumigants. Um, soil fumigants are not allowed for high tunnel production, so keep that in mind. Certain nematicides are not allowed, um, but there's still several that are. So if that is something that you're um, interested in, we can talk about that more. Um, However, uh, nematicides and fumigants, the research has shown that yes, they will reduce populations, that, that those populations rebound after a season or so. And with fumigants, those are broad spectrum. So you are, when you apply a fumigant, you are basically killing everything in the soil. Um, and what often happens is when you knock down everything, including beneficial microorganisms, the pathogens rebound faster than the beneficial ones. So, um, and then there's genetic resistance. So this MI gene um, is what is in uh, the resistant rootstocks that we're going to be talking about. So, um, and it is only resistant to Meloidogyne incognita southern root knot, so not northern root knot. So we have two projects going on here in Kentucky. And one is, um, and, and a couple of objectives. So we wanna determine the level of pressure that plant parasitic nematodes exert on vegetable cropping systems across the state, specifically in high tunnels, because, and the, the reason for looking at high tunnels is because there's less rotation happening. Um, and so we're thinking that if it's going to be anywhere, it's certainly going to be in the high tunnel because there's just an intensive, not less rotational um, cropping system happening. And then another objective is to evaluate grafting as a non-chemical method for management of root knot nematodes in Kentucky high tunnel systems. And so um, research has shown that this is a, a pretty viable strategy. But one of the components that needs to be considered is that that MI gene, that resistance, that natural resistance that a lot of rootstocks have um, can be broken with high soil temperatures. So as you can imagine, anyone who's even moderately familiar with high tunnels, right, those covered structures, they get extremely hot in the summer, um, which is we were looking for that protected system, right? But in the middle of July in Kentucky, um, soil temperatures can be, air temperatures are very high and soil temperatures can also be quite high. So objective one was, you know, our plant, basically our questions are, are plant parasitic nematodes a problem in Kentucky, specifically root knot nematode? Where are they a problem and what species? So we were looking at hapla, basically expecting to see hapla and incognito. And this is what we found. <clears throat> so the blue circles indicate no presence of root knot nematode was found. Um, the yellow stars are in incognita, the meloidogyne incognita. So that's the southern root knot nematode, which is more um, destruct, can be more destructive for crops, more detrimental, more galling. Um, it's really a problem. And then meloidogyne hapla, you may have meloidogyne hapla and not notice. Um, so it can be, you know, it can detract from your yield, 
but it, the galling is usually not as severe and you may not notice um, that you have it. And so we did find that. And as you can see, there's not really a pattern. I thought perhaps more Northern Kentucky would have Northern root knot and, and that is just not the case so, so far anyway. So um, if there are any growers, Kentucky growers with high tunnels or um, agents who are on here who I haven't already contacted, um, we are looking to sample this summer. And so please let us know if you're interested in, in us sampling. Um, this would be a free uh, contribution to um, this research and you'd get, you'd get the information as well. So objective two is, can we use grafted resistant rootstock to effectively manage root knot name showed? Um, what rootstock performs best? How much better are resistant rootstocks compared to non-grafted plants, right? Is it worth it for a grower to invest in that grafting component? Because it is expensive and I'll go into that a little bit more. Um, is it worth it? So for those of you less familiar with grafting or maybe not familiar at all, right? Grafting is a cultural practice that helps manage a whole host of problems. Uh, nematodes or plant parasitic nematodes are just one issue that you can address, right? So um, soil borne diseases, improving abiotic stress tolerance and typically crop yield is enhanced. So it's commercially used for solanaceous and cucurbit production. For the purpose of this talk, I'm focusing on tomato grafting. Um, what you're doing is combining the desirable root system of one plant, um, which would be disease resistance or maybe stress, some stress tolerance, right? With another plant that has that desirable fruit quality, right? The above ground, the fruiting portion. And so just to get you familiar with some terms, so the scion is the plant that has the desirable fruit characteristics. So the top portion of the graft right here. So this, um, this part, whoops. And then the rootstock, the plant that has the desirable disease resistance, stress tolerance, vigorous root system characteristics, what have you, um, is this part, right? The meristem is the plant tissue that contains undifferentiated cells from which growth begins. Um, so that that's also known as growing point, right? That's just kind of a fancy name for the growing point. Um, the apical meristem is the upper, the uppermost um, growing point. And so I've seen this a couple of times where people accidentally, um, you know, take off that apical meristem and then they wonder why they have really short, bushy tomato plants. Um, that's why you've, you've, you've kind of knocked, knocked its knees out from under it and decapitated it, if you will. And um, so it's gonna grow out, not up anymore. Um, adventitious roots are roots that develop from the stem. And we see that a lot in tomatoes. I'm sure a lot of you have, right? They get a little stressed or maybe you leave them in the trays too long, right? They're kind of old. Um, they'll start getting these like roots coming out of the stem. And then cotyledons are the leaves that first emerge from the seed. So not the true leaves, but the leaves that emerge from the seed. Um, so, okay. So to man it, so what, You've probably gotten some of this already from what I've said so far, but a lot of people do need a little bit of um, walking through why they should even consider it, right? So if, even if you don't have nematodes, grafting may be something you want to consider. If you have some other soil-borne disease you're really struggling with that also is tough to rotate um, out of, right? If you don't want to give up vegetable production, um, you may want to consider um, grafting. Crop yield, <clears throat> plant vigor, and improving plant vigor, improving stress tolerance to drought, heat, soil salinity. And then each rootstock is different and will offer different benefits. So it's really important that you read the description carefully, talk to your county agent, talk to an extension specialist and, and say, what should, these are my problems. This is what I'm trying to address. What do you think? What would you, is this for me, right? So considerations before grafting, 
right? There is going to be extra labor unless you're buying your grafted plants. So in that case, it's gonna be even more cost, um, including shipping most likely. Um, to my knowledge, there is not anyone in Kentucky offering this service. Um, you can certainly order them from nearby states and have them shipped. They arrive in perfect condition. You don't need to worry about that. They're usually expedited shipping, um, but of course that is a cost. So extra labor, if you're doing it yourself, extra labor, extra time, extra materials, right? All this is also contributes to the cost. The rootstock seed itself is more expensive than regular seed. So keep that in mind. And then before deciding to incorporate this into your farming system, consider why you really need this, um, right? What are your particular problems that you're trying to address? Is there something else you can do first, like a cultural practice um, that could help address things? Um, because chances are you're gonna have to do something in addition to grafting to solve whatever issue you have, right? Um, and then what is your market strategy to cover the additional cost? Even if you're doing it yourself and you think you're saving money, you're still spending more than you normally would. Right. And then what scions and rootstocks are you going to use and why? So know that, like have, have that already fleshed out, right? Why you're going to do what you're doing. So setting up for grafting success. This is if you're going to do it yourself, right? You want to raise really healthy seedlings prior to grafting. So these are the cotyledons, right? And then this, these are the first two true leaves forming. So you want to graft seedlings when they are really fairly small, so 1.5 to 2 millimeters stem diameter. Um, the bigger they are, the harder they take to that grafting, um, in my experience. So you, these would be a little too small, right? You want them to have at least a set of full grown set of true leaves. Um, but um, you don't want them to be too big, too, because that makes it challenging. And you want to allow for proper post-graft healing. So um, keep in the dark for a few days to allow that graft union to heal. So you want to kind of discourage photosynthesis and encourage just healing that graft union. So tomatoes ideal germination is around 85 degrees Fahrenheit. I certainly would not go above that. Um, you, you may need a heating mat if growing them in the colder months. Right, so we normally do use a heating mat. Um, a lot of our grafting happens in January or February where it's gray outside. And although we have a heated greenhouse, it's still a little too cold. Um, you wanna grow rootstocks and scions that have similar stem diameters at the time of grafting. So this is probably gonna require that the seedlings are, this, you seed them on different dates. So the rootstocks are more vigorous, right? In most cases, that's, that's why you purchase them in many cases. So you're going to um, seed those maybe a few days after you seed um, your scions. And that is something I cannot give you too much more guidance than that because it really depends on your rootstock and your scion selection as to what um, what those days, what those differences are. There's no general rule. Um, what I would advise is to perform a small test with a few seeds of your, of your choice, right? And kind of see how quickly they germinate in comparison to one another. And so do not even bother grafting plants that look stressed or diseased or not perfect in any way because that they will not survive the grafting process and you will be wasting your time. So you can successfully graft tomato seedlings with a, wide, with a fairly wide range of sizes. Younger seedlings generally heal faster. So about 1.5 to three millimeters. Again, three millimeters, I know that does not sound big, but um, once you get into that range, you will notice they're pretty thick stems. Um, so I like the 1.5 to 2 um, range. The silicone grafting clips, um, I think I've only seen them from 1.5 to 3. 
There are some other clips that come in larger sizes, but those are often used for cucurbit crafting. And again, the smaller, usually the smaller the, the stems are at the time of grafting, the more likely they are going to successfully heal. And I like the transparent clips, these graph silicone, because then I can see when things have matched up perfectly and I have aligned everything. So the splice graft is what my lab uses and it's the most common grafting method for tomato grafting. So you would cut the rootstock stem, you cut at a pretty deep angle, um, let's say at least 45, right? to create more, you want to create more surface area um, so that there's more <laughs> surface area just to match up with scion and, and um, rootstock and they can heal together quicker. You're going to cut either below or above those cotyledons that I referenced, right? So you notice that um, a lot of uh, little transplants, little seedlings still have their cotyledons, so you can see where they are. Above, if you cut above the cotyledons, you will have more space between the graft union and the soil, but they can form suckers, right? So here we've got graft union suckers. Below usually eliminates the sucker issue, but the graft union is typically closer to the soil and can form adventitious roots. So I will probably say this again, but absolutely do not let your graft union, when you transplant your grafted plants, whether you buy them or you do them yourself, the graft union should not come in contact with the soil. It always needs to be above the soil line. Um, and I'm saying that because a lot of people do tend to plant their tomatoes kind of deep into the soil. That's kind of a, that's a normal thing. If you, if that graft union comes in contact with soil, you're kind of eliminating the reason for grafting in the first place, right? Because um, your scion will take on roots and then your root, your root stock is kind of pointless. So you can see here, there's a graft union, graft union, here's the sucker, rootstock sucker. Um, so just, there's kind of a plus and minus to both of them. Um, I, my group normally does um, graft below the cotyledons. But again, if you're careful, you can, you can do it kind of either way. So step two, right, is cut the scion stem. And so what I normally do is if I have a tray of, um, I'll have a tray of rootstock and a tray of scions, I will cut all the tops off of the rootstocks and throw them away, right? So there's no confusion at all. Um, and so I normally am in a, a tray of 50, right? Uh, 50 cells. And so I, I cannot, confuse the tops of the rootstock at all. I get rid of them. And then I cut the scion stem. I cut it at the same angle as I did with the rootstock. So you're wanting to hold your hand at pretty much the same angle with every cut. And they make grafting knives that kind of help you keep that angle. Then you're going to place the grafting clip on the rootstock. So you can see that here. And then you leave half of the clip up above the rootstock um, to receive the scion and it should fit snug. It shouldn't readily slide. You should really have to kind of tug. I usually tug on it a little bit to see how tight you want it to be a snug fit on both the scion and the rootstock. And then you're gonna match up the scion and the rootstock. So the angles are perfectly matched. They should be kind of mirror images of one another. And you're going to insert the sign into the Thank grafting you, clip and orient the two cuts so they Thank fit you. together and you want complete full contact. So here is an excellent photo, right? Complete full contact. No, no, right? So keep that in mind. So uh, post graft healing is really essential to this is, is essential, this matching of these angles and the you know, that is that this there's no way this would ever heal right either of these but 
Um, plants should be ready to grow in normal conditions about two, I'd say, give it two weeks after grafting. You can, if you're good, you can do 10 days or maybe a week. Um, I normally wait a full two weeks from grafting to planting. I like that buffer to, to make sure everything's um, okay. So the first 48 hours after grafting are really important. Um, mist plants immediately after grafting, cover with the clear plastic dome. I usually mist the inside of the dome as well. And you wanna keep plants um, at least in low light. It doesn't have to be pitch, pitch dark or anything like that. Um, dark or low light, and you wanna reduce water loss and photosynthesis, that's that idea. And you don't want it to be too hot. Um, you know, maintain temperatures between 75 and 85. You're, you're gonna have to miss things periodically. And usually it's about three days. If things survive two to three days, you're probably okay. Um, and, you know, at that three day mark, you should be able to see what has survived and what has not if you're doing it yourself. And so this is the, we've, this is an incubation chamber that we use as a graft healing chamber. And that's what this, that's what this looks like. So make sure you buy tall enough domes and they just sit on top of these trays. And so you can see these little popsicle sticks here. So that is something that some of the companies like Johnny's offers um, and it basically helps keep them upright. So they didn't used to have that. Um, the first year or two I was grafting, they didn't have these little popsicle stick type things. They are sucker sticks, I guess. They, they're more like lollipop sticks. And um, it kind of just, it's connected to the silicone grafting clip and it just kind of helps keep things upright. So after 72 hours, we will remove plants from this chamber and we'll gradually reduce the humidity over four days or so and um, will also gradually increase light for four days or so. So you do not want to water overhead with a watering hose. You mist with a spray bottle um, very lightly. Um, you do, because that graft union is not completely sealed up yet. So um, you could knock the grafted plants off, you know, the scions off the rootstock still. And as the grafted plants grow, those grafting clips will just drop off. They will, you don't need to manually take them off. You can if you want to. Um, if you reuse them, you know, just make sure to sanitize them. But the plant will just push, basically push that um, clip off. It won't be girdled by that clip as it grows. So here's an example, Maxi Fort rootstock. This is a couple years older, so this may, uh, this is probably even more expensive now. 50 seeds um, was almost 25 bucks, right? Um, this is one of the industry standards, this Maxi Fort. Um, it has a high resistance to Fusarium races one and two, Fusarium root rot, root knot nematodes, corky root rot, tobacco mosaic virus, verticillium wilt. Um, this, they always have this disclaimer, disease resistance is not transferred to the seed companies will have this a lot of times, uh, transferred to the cyan plant. That interaction is still not super well understood. And so um, the transfer from um, rootstock to scion and, and the um, resistance or susceptibility of one or the other, right? Um, this is not terribly well understood yet. Estimino, a little cheaper. Uh, this has gone up for sure by now, um, about 22 bucks. And here again, um, you can see it's disease resistance package, right? And so root knot nematodes, they always say root knot nematodes. What they mean is Southern root knot nematode, not Northern root knot nematode. So rotations in high tunnel, as I said, are difficult and uh, oftentimes don't exist for a lot of growers. They just do the same thing over and over again because of the market and usually they're driven by that. Um, so the most high value crop is tomato 
um, per square foot in a high tunnel. And many growers really are growing nothing but tomato. And root knot nematode also has a really wide host range, as I said, so which includes almost all vegetable crops. So if you were to rotate, you're still limited in what you can rotate. Many growers are not aware even of the, that they have root knot nematode or they, some don't even know that it's a thing, right? And so you've got a lot of um, factors working against each other. So we had a tomato grafting on farm trial. This was in Knox County. Um, the, the high tunnel grower was an experienced tomato grower, commercial, he grew commercially, and we confirmed that he did have root knot nematode in his tunnels, in the tunnel we were in, and it was in, in incognita, southern root knot nematode, which is an important thing if you're, if you um, think you have nematodes, right, make sure you get confirmation from a lab on what species it is. Um, grower, the grower chose the scion as Primo Red because that is what he had always grown and that's what his market, that's what people expected from him on, uh, as far as his customers. And the rootstocks were Maxi Fort, Estimino, Arnold, and Xinjiang Gang. And we'll I'll just probably refer to this as Shin from now on, it's just a little shorter. Um, so the plants were grafted about one month prior to transplanting. The grafted plants were transplanted in February and included a non-graft control, so just a non-grafted Primo Red. And the project was terminated in August the first year, and then we repeated it, and it was terminated at the end of July the second year. So we collected monthly soil samples, which were root knot nematode J2, that juvenile, second stage juvenile. There was destructive root sampling at the end of each uh, year, and that's what I'm doing here. And then the grower collected the yield, um, just as he would normally, he weighed, weighed it per plot. And then we also collected plant biomass. I'm moving boxes around so I can read this to you all. So the non-grafted control, that was just the Primo Red, 230 pounds. And this is a mean yield from 72 plants per treatment, nine plants per treatment plot times eight reps. So if it's easier for you to wrap your head around the yield per plant, a lot of growers, that's why I have that here. This and this are the same thing. Um, that's maybe a little bit easier to understand for people. So non-grafted control was a 25 pounds per plant yield compared to shin 29.6. So those, so these letters indicate um, statistical difference. So because these two have the same letters from a statistical standpoint, they are basically the same. These three, Arnold, Estimino, and Maxi Fort did much better than a, the non-grafted control or Shen. Um, they have different letters, meaning that they are statistically different. And, um, Estimino had 35.55, Arnold 35.49, and Maxi Fort 36.22. So really good for those of you familiar with tomato plant yield, um, this is pretty good, um, very good in fact. So the average yield um, in 2021, the average plant yield was a little lower. Um, it also ended earlier as the grower's choice. I suspect that's why we have um, lower yield here. Um, 17, 17.99, and then the, again, the three. So I think the, the big takeaway here is this pattern that these three root stocks with Primo Red as the scion performed significantly better compared to the non-grafted control and this um, Shin root stock. So um, here are the nematode data, um, the non-grafted um, control. So this is soil sampling right around the roots of the plants. And so this is per 100 grams of soil. And so as you can see, much higher, this is, would be J2s um, in the non-grafted control. Um, Maxi Fort though also had pretty high numbers. 
And then these were pretty low throughout the season. So this is in August at the end of the season. So this is even more telling, right? It's had all, all summer, all spring and summer to reproduce. And this is what we get. Um, and then this is the root, what was in the root. So um, average root knot nematodes. So these are eggs per gram of root, almost 20,000 in per gram of root, in, which is kind of wild to think about. Um, in the non-grafted control, 11,000 in maxi fort, 1,000, 730 in the other three root stocks. So these three did much better um, from a reproduction, low reproduction, root non nematode reproduction standpoint. The, uh, and then similar, uh, you know, a somewhat similar pattern here um, in 2021, but instead of maxi fort being kind of out there on its own, all four rootstocks performed significantly better compared to the um, non-grafted control. And so just for those of you who are um, wondering, well, what do these numbers really mean? How much trouble is this person in as far as um, root knot nematode control? So one root knot nematode per gram of root, so one egg per gram of root is considered bad high and 20 root knot nematode per 100 cc's which is roughly 100 grams it can be is considered high so a lot we are working with a lot here so here's another way to um, look at this over time um, so march april may june july august right it skyrockets in this is the non-grafted control same pattern, very similar pattern here in 2021. So the populations in the soil skyrocket. Not quite, but as you can see, so it is much lower in 2021. So part of that is telling me that we're perhaps doing something right um, from the standpoint of managing, right? The population, this, you can see the scale here is up to 1400, whereas this is 600. So it is going down over time. Here's a nice photo of some ugly roots. We've got the non grafted Primo red. You can see how gnarled that is. And then, you know, there's a little bit of galling here. There's, you can see it there with um, Maxi Fort, but the other two look pretty normal, honestly. So some conclusions to draw from this. Um, is that our survey is that root knot nematode is all over the place, certainly in Kentucky. I suspect it is in Tennessee as well, if we have any Tennessee viewers. Um, and a lot of our growers did not even know that they had it. So we called people, we contacted growers um, and went on, went on to their farms and sampled. Uh, most of, in most cases, it's not like they were calling us and saying, hey, I think I have a problem, right? Um, and then once we kind of, once we found it, we kind of talked to them, they'd say, oh yeah, I have been noticing some of this or some of that, but I didn't know what it was, right? Grafted tomatoes are a really feasible management strategy for root knot nematode, but I suspect it will need to be combined with something else, right? Whether that's nematicides or a really solid rotational strategy, solarization, which as I said, we're looking into um, this summer and or biofumigation. So some, some things to consider. Um, we will continue that soil survey of high tunnels across Kentucky, um, root knot nematode host assays. So we're, we're the point of a host assay is to look for non-hosts evaluate different crops. Um, a lot of people say, well, you want me to rotate or you're saying I should rotate, what should I rotate to? And so we're gonna be analyzing a lot of different vegetable crops to see if we can find some non-hosts. Um, solar, soil solarization and high tunnel, they did say that was happening and, um, and also some grafting trainings for agents and growers are on the horizon. So here's a couple of fact sheets. We do have this root knot nematode fact sheet out. Um, 
you can find either either one of these numbers should get you to it. Um, it is online. And then the basics of biofumigation, if you're curious about that, um, you can find that one.